Um, so, you know, we talked about last week how that God had done a miracle for Peter and how the church was praying for him and God sent the angel and opened the doors and the miraculous deliverance that God brought Peter out of prison. And of course, we, we talked about how the church was praying, but they, their faith was weak. They didn't really believe that it was going to really happen. And when it happened, they were the most shocked of all. And I don't know about you, but that story is a great deal of encouragement to me because uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm praying about things, I don't feel like my faith is up to the very top. Anybody feel that way? Man, I tell you, I, I've been praying, but boy, I'm telling you, it's tough. And uh, it's good to see Sean and Shannon too this, this evening. They've been in, having so many physical things, so it's good to see them in the house of the Lord tonight. But, you know, it's just amazing, isn't it? Of course, Carmen's been out a little while too there. Hello, Carmen. <laughs> good to see you. Um, uh, it's, it's just, you know, encouraging to me to know that God can answer prayer even if I'm not perfect. And I hadn't got it all together perfect, and I hadn't said it all right. And there have been even times when my faith wavered. <laughs> I'm so glad that God is bigger than me. And He doesn't work like me, and He doesn't think like me, and He doesn't even think like other people think about me. <laughs> and, and I'm so glad. This, this story has always been encouragement to me because when you consider that when Peter showed up, they didn't even believe it was Peter. I mean, they, they you, know, you heard the story last week if you were here about how they, you know, they kept on saying, no, you're, that's his spirit. Or you're just, you know, they thought that woman was crazy for thinking Peter was at the, at the door, at the gate knocking. <laughs> yeah, they had already decided he wasn't going to make it back, hadn't they, Johnny? But God wasn't through uh, with Peter. And God uh, used, I believe with all my heart, God used the prayer of the church. And thank God for praying, church. And I believe we should pray. And, and the last thing I said is don't ever give up. Just because your faith wavers and you feel a little weak and you don't feel like you got it all together and you're doing everything right. You know, I know years ago there was a big movement that everything you got from God depended on you doing everything right. But that's so, that's so much bondage. <laughs> because I'm going to tell you what, no matter how good you are, you're not ever going to do everything right. You're not ever going to pray right. You're not ever going to get it all right. No, it isn't doctrinally sound, but that's, that's the way they made me feel because I never felt good enough to pray for anybody. Y'all in the boat with me? During all that time, you know, they'd say, I need prayer for, I'm sick, and I'm going, somebody else come pray. I ain't got no faith. <laughs> you know, that's kind of how I felt. But thank God, you know, I'm glad to, to know that, you know, it's my part to be obedient and God does the rest. And so therefore, if I'm not perfect, he still works. And that's a big old hallelujah. Yeah. That's a big old hallelujah. And great freedom, <laughs> a great freedom because none of us ever feel like we deserve or we're the person that can, you know, do all the maj majestic things that we'd like to be able to do. But thank God that God will use us. We are all flawed. We are all uh, have areas in our life that we don't get it all right all the time, but I'm so thankful that God doesn't write us off, doesn't quit, doesn't give up on us. He keeps on drawing us. He keeps on molding us, and hopefully we are growing. And as we grow, our faith will become stronger. But in the process, while we're growing, God doesn't say, well, I'm not going to use you till you get this grown. You know, God keeps on working with us in the state we're in. I'm thankful for that. So we know that after Peter was delivered out of prison and nobody knew how he got out, you know, he, he was even in amazement the whole time the angel was taking him out of the prison. And when he got out of the prison, uh, the, the Bible tells us in verse number 18, as, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir. I love the way the Bible talks, don't y'all? There was no small stir. Instead of saying there was a huge stir, <laughs> the Bible says there was no small stir among the soldiers. Uh, what was become of Peter? <coughs> so they, they began to get a little worried and they had reason to get worried because back then if a prisoner escaped, the guards were killed. You know, that, you remember the guards that guarded the tomb of Jesus? You know, and those guys made a deal with them. If you'll tell this lie for us, we won't kill you because the, they were really should have been killed by their own way of thinking. But because they were willing to lie, 
that the soldiers, they said, they said, you know, his followers came and took his body out of the grave. And so they kept those guys alive. But these, it says, and when Herod had sought for him and found him, un him not, he examined the keepers. He didn't believe the story, but you know, who in the world could believe the story? You know, excuse me, I was standing there and the next thing you know, I never did see him go and the door was still locked when, and I don't know how he got out of the cell. And he went all the way out. I don't know how this happened. And, and so there was no decent story they could tell. And he commanded that they all should be put to death. And then he went on down to Judea and, and, and Caesarea and their abode. So he just, he, did, he had it dealt with. He took care of them. He had them killed and then he left. And he says that he was highly displeased with Tyre and Sidon. Now this is a totally different story. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with the deliverance of Peter. In this story, we see that Herod, the one who was involved in killing James, and also in putting Peter in prison with a full plan the next day to kill Peter. So this was the king that had been left in position. He was a Jew. He had been left in position to be sort of the king. And he had killed James, was trying to kill Peter. And now he's, the Bible says that he's in this quandary with Tyre and Sidon, and it's all about a trade deal. Y'all all know about trade deals because we know all about that in America. And, and according to this situation, uh, there was an argument going on between him and these countries or these cities or whatever they were. And, he, and it says, and they came with one accord to him and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king. So, you know, they're going over there scared that they're going to lose their benefits. So they running over there to the king to try to, you know, straighten up this situation. They were flattering the king and all this. You're going to see this as we go forward because they didn't want to lose all those things that the, that the king was able. You know, that, that's the compromise that we can go through because we don't want to lose something sometime, we'll compromise and we'll even give in to things that aren't true at all if we're not careful in order to keep the things that we think we have to have. You know, we got to get to the place in our lives that God's enough. We really do. Because if we got dependence upon anything else except God, it's all shaky ground. You know, I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I, I go out and I proudly vote for somebody and then they in office for a year or two and I want to throw them out. <laughs> because they don't do what they said they were going to promise they were going to do when they got in. You know what I'm saying? So all of us have those kind of things, not just in politics, in life in general. We put all of our eggs in some basket and then that basket falls apart or that person is not reliable or those circumstances don't work out the way we thought. I'm telling you, there is nothing unchangeable and all powerful except God, nothing. So we must see that. But these guys come, what, what we call sometimes schmoozing up to the king trying to uh, mend this difference between them. It says, and upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel. Now he's, he's, he's enjoying, you know, uh, let me stop here long enough to say again, you should never believe everything that everybody brags about you about. Come on. So don't believe it. You got some people in your life always lifting, you always trying to puff you up and brag on you. Don't believe everything. And don't believe everything people say bad about you. You got to understand there's people around you that are going to tell you lies that make you feel good. And there's people around that tell lies that make you feel bad. That's life. And you can't believe either one of those. We want to believe these guys over here that's making us all, whew, makes me feel good. Let me go over there. I remember when Carolyn Hitt went to church here. She was a lady that was here several years ago and died of cancer. But she said people, she had a shop wherever they lived in before they came here. She said she had a full shop. She had a frame shop. She framed, uh, you know, art. And she said her whole shop stayed full of people because she was a flatterer. 
and they came in to be flattered. Come on. So we need to be careful. You're not as good as those people that think you're the greatest thing that ever came along. You're not that good. I'm not that good. And, but it, he came out in all of, his, all of his pomp and all of his splendor, and he sat on his throne and made an oration unto them. I'm sure he carried on this long oration speaking about how great he was, I guess. And the people gave a shout. They were shouting and hollering, Woohoo, Herod! <laughs> and you know what they said? It is the voice of a God and not of a man. Now, this guy didn't stop them. You know, Paul, when somebody tried to bow down to him and say, Oh, you are God, or, you know, the, in the Ephesians or wherever it was, and he told them, no, no, uh, don't, you don't bow, you don't, you don't lift me up. I'm not a God. I'm not anything holy. But this guy didn't stop him. Herod was enjoying, and the more they bragged on him, the bigger he was and the greater he felt about himself. And he got very puffed up in pride. And the Bible says, because he gave not, and immediately an angel of the Lord smote him. Why? Because he gave not God the glory. He took glory. You know, the Bible says in another place, God doesn't share his glory with any man. God doesn't share his glory with any man. No man should ever try to equate himself to be equal in any slight way with God. There's only one God. And his holiness and his majesty and who he is is so far above us that we will only know that when we see him face to face. We will not know how great he is until we see him. All we do now is live by faith. But because Herod got lifted up, and I, now Herod was a Jew, remember. He wasn't a pagan. He was a Jew. He knew who the true God was. I don't know if God had, would have done the same thing had not Herod been a Jew. But because Herod was a Jew, because he had been trained and knew as a child, because all Jewish boys do, no. And when he took on the credit and all these people saying you're a God, and he didn't stop them from saying that kind of mess, immediately he was judged and, and because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms. Brother Swagger's notes say it took him about five days to die. I don't know who came up with that. But regardless of how, I always pictured him just getting eaten up and right there on the throne and dying in front of everybody. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> but I do know it was a horrible way to die. You know, when you usually get eaten up in, with worms is after you're dead, right? <laughs> but... Herod got it in advance. The Bible says that he was eaten up with worms and gave up the ghost. You know what? I just want to tell you something, church. Don't mess with God. <laughs> don't make God lower than he is. Don't, don't be one of those kind of people that, and I don't think you are. I don't think there's anybody in here like that. But, you know, it just doesn't hurt for us to remember that we don't bring God down to human level. He's not human. He is God, and we are we are just a speck on the scenery, and he chooses by his great grace to live in us. But we should never, ever take him for granted or bring him down or treat him like a man or talk about him in any way except understanding the great holiness of God. And so Herod died in the midst of his, you know what this was? This was pride. This was human Pride, you know, pride is the first sin. And it's the basis of most sins, or all sins, I guess. The first sin that happens because of pride, because of Adam and Eve's sense of pride that took over in their situation where they felt they could become as God if they took that fruit, they could become as God. That's what the devil told them, and that's why they ate the fruit. 
So it was a sense of pride that led them into sin. And any time we get brought off into failure or sin, we're going to go back to a situation where we have to understand there's a little pride involved. I can do this myself. You need to talk loud. Pride yeah, I got that in here. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. I got that right here. Let me read the first one. Uh, that one is that one that he just quoted is in uh, Proverbs 16 and 18, in case you'd like to know. Pride goeth before a, for destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So it's like a parade. When pride goes out in front, then there's going to be destruction. And then when a, a haughty spirit is out in front, then it's gonna, there's going to be a fall. Another one that... Um, uh, another couple of verses that I found I thought were pretty appropriate here. In Psalm 28 and 4, it says, uh, this is an interesting one, Give them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them after the work of their hands. Render to them their desert. There, here the psalmist is talking about wicked, proudful, prideful human beings, men, women, people. When I say men, I mean people who exalt themselves up to consider that they are the ones who are in charge like God. I mean, you know, to whom much is given, much is required, guys. You know, if you're going to take a big position, you've you got more laying at your feet when you've got to answer to God. And the more responsibility and the more uh, you take in your own hands to orchestrate people's lives... I'm telling you, it's all going to be at your feet when you stand before God. Ministers who don't preach the truth of the gospel, stand in the pulpit and lead people astray, are going to answer to God as wicked people. And no matter who it is, I don't care who it is, ministers, politicians, leaders of any kind, leaders of colleges, leaders of schools, who set down laws and lead people astray in the, in, in, even in the curriculum and the training they're doing in schools, all of these things are going to be laying at the feet of the wicked people who are orchestrating these things around the world, not just in the United States. Every human being who ha takes on that responsibility of swaying people's hearts or swaying people's opinions, and they're leading them contrary to the Word of God, all of these things are going to be laid at their feet when they are thrown into hell. Very, very serious. Give them according to their deeds, is what the psalmist says. Give them. God's keeping a record. God knows what's going on. He is keeping a record. And sometimes, you know, because, because justice doesn't happen overnight, and this is, uh, Young and I have talked about this before, talked about the death penalty and how that it's not much of a deterrent anymore because you can stay in prison on death row until you die there. You know, they arrest you and give you the death penalty, but then you sit there on death row. Not very often does anybody ever actually suffer death, the death penalty anymore. And because of that, it's not a deterrent anymore. Now, when they used to take them out and hang them high immediately, <laughs> you say, well, they might not have been guilty. And now I understand all that. I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm just saying when justice is delayed, it's not a deterrent to crime anymore. And sometimes when we see people being so evil and causing so many people so much damage and hurting people and leading people astray, you think, Lord, why do you take so long? And we get, our, our time frame is short and we don't understand that. But I'm going to tell you, God's keeping records and ultimately he is the one who will have the final say. And he will correct and take care of those things that are going in the wrong direction. And it says, according to the wickedness of their endeavors, give them after the work of their hands, render to them their desert. Give them what they deserve. Give them what they deserve. Proverbs 18 and 12 says, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty. And before honor is humility. Before de destruction, the heart of man is haughty. But before honor is humility. Humble yourselves down, the scripture says. Humble yourselves down.
That's the way it's supposed to be. I've always, when I read that passage of scripture, I always think, Lord, I want to always humble myself down under the mighty hand of God because I don't want you to ever have to humble me. <laughs> now, I'd rather him humble me than for me to stay haughty. But I'd much rather humble myself. And then the Bible says, if y'all humble yourself down under the mighty hand of God in due season, he will exalt you. He will lift you up. He will prove your point. He will make you seen for what you really are when you are serving God with a humble heart. So then it says, he gave up the ghost, he died. But guess what? The next verse tells us that did not hinder the growth of God's word. God's got a plan, guys. And he's going to work it out. I, I don't know. He didn't tell me before I came to church tonight exactly how his plan is going to work out and when. I, I haven't heard that. And I, if I do, I'm going to be careful because I think he's not going to tell me that. But I can tell you, he is working out a plan. God's working out a plan. Everybody listen to me. And that plan is going to be worked out and nobody on this earth past, present, or future is ever going to stop God's plan from working out. You can rest in that. Hallelujah in that. Amen. And so in spite of all the things that Herod tried to do, all the destruction, killing, you know, when they start killing Christians, don't give up then. God will give you the grace. You know, I believe with all my heart that if you had to go through what Peter went through or what James went through, God will give you the grace when the time comes. I trust him like that. It happened in Afghanistan right before, after all the Americans were gone and the missionaries in Afghanistan and the people that were born again Christians in Afghanistan, they started going door to door. They knew they were going to die anyway, but instead of sitting in a hole trying to hide, they started going door to door and witnessing the people about accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they saw many people converted to Christianity as they were in the midst of knowing they were going to be dying shortly. And they did, and many have died. But they brought many people into the kingdom because they knew there's a greater plan than what you see on this earth. We just see from day to day, we see short range. God sees long range, and He has a great future planned. And we can rest in that and know that God is not, you know, he, he doesn't have ulcers <laughs> and he don't have a bad heart and he don't have tired legs and, you know, he don't have any of those things. He's just a great and mighty God and he is eternal and he has a plan and it is going to be worked out in its time and in its way. So in spite of all the per persecution, the word of God grew and multiplied. He didn't say the church grew. Now I believe the church automatically will grow. But it was the word of God that was being promoted and spoken out and the word of God grew. It began to go further. More people knew the, the truth of the gospel of the word of Almighty God. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. They, he went back to Antioch uh, when they had fulfilled their ministry. Remember they were going there to take uh, uh, gifts that were given to them, to them at, in uh, Jerusalem. And they took with them John, whose surname was Mark, and we call him Mark. And they are going to be sent out on their first missionary journey. Now, in the book of Acts, you will see that Paul went on. Does anybody know how many missionary journeys he went on in the book of Acts? <laughs> I didn't look that up, but I think it's five, if I'm not mistaken. But this is the first missionary journey that he went on. And it says that there were in the church, I'm in verse number, I'm chapter number 13. And there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, who were called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manon, which had been brought up from Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord. These people had been converted. They were prophets and teachers in the church. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, or this refers to worship, the Holy Spirit said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. So he, th as they prayed and sought God, he gave them direction. God's direction is always to expand his kingdom on this earth. 
God is never in the business of exalting some man and making him some big shot. That's not God's purpose. God's purpose is to expand his kingdom on this earth, to reach more people with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And just because somebody is big and has a big following doesn't mean necessarily that that's a person God is using. You, you don't, we don't know. You know, when we get to heaven, it's when we're going to know who is actually the one that God used the most. We're not going to really know. Only heaven will tell that because we judge things by natural things. You know, we look at big, huge crowds. I, I was always amazed uh, way back in the beginning, back in the 70s and 80s when Brother Swagger went out to the big football stadiums and thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I was just amazed at seeing the numbers of people. And Billy Graham, I mean, you know, amazing how people in America came to hear the real gospel because both of them preached the real gospel, the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. And they gathered in crowds. And I, I'm a firm believer that if we preach the truth of Jesus to the crowds, that people will listen. But we have to be actively out there. You know, people that are in the streets who are going from, from uh, person to person out there and everybody you meet, you try to give the message of Jesus. Who knows where that person will be up on a higher rung than somebody who may be speaking to a large congregation because they're actually doing more of what God wants them to do. So God doesn't judge it by the crowds. He judges it by your willingness and obedience and presenting yourself in a willingness to say, Lord, take me wherever you want me to go. One person is just important to God as a hundred. You know, he took Philip all the way over to, to the eunuch. Uh, he took him away from a revival and set him over there to minister to one eunuch who was trying to understand the Bible. He was fulfilling the plan of God. So, so don't be little. Don't, don't make small the little things that God might want you to do. Maybe it's a neighbor who needs Jesus that the Lord just wants you to spend some time, invite them over for a hamburger or, or a piece of cake and just spend some time ministering to them and encouraging them and bringing them into the kingdom might be a greater task accomplished that you don't even know what you're doing than somebody who's standing and giving some big oration sermon in front of a bunch of people. God knows. So whatever God uses us to do, don't belittle that. And then it says, And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. And they be, being for, sent forth by the Holy Spirit, departing unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Now Cyprus is Barnabas' hometown. And when they were at Sal Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. That's Mark, John Mark, that, that was with them. You'll notice that Paul, Paul and Jesus, I'm going to make this point. This is an important point. Every time they went to a, a place, a town, they went to the synagogue. You know, the Bible says to the Jew first, then to the Greek. Remember that? So they were reaching out to the Jews first. But the synagogue was the most closely doctrinally sound place where people were meeting to know God. Now, had they had the people in the synagogue did not have the revelation that Jesus was the Messiah. But many of them were devout in trying to follow the Old Testament. So when Jesus was on this planet, the only perfect man who ever lived, right? only perfect man who ever lived, every time he went to town, he went to the synagogue. You know, there's another thing Jesus had the ability to know. He knew the man standing in the pulpit. There was no real pulpit, but I'm just using that. He knew that he wasn't right all the time. He rightly divided. Jesus knew the Word of God. He didn't have to guess that. He knew, the, he knew exactly everything about God's law. He knew all about God. He knew. He was God. <laughs> he is God. Right, Brother Johnny. So what I'm trying to say is here's a man who is perfect in his generation walking on this planet as a perfect human being. 
all the time knowing and judging, able to judge the hearts of men. If you saw him in the New Testament, he, he revealed what was in the heart of people all the time. But he went to church. It amazes me how many people are out there, and you're not, you're here, so I'm not preaching to you. But it's a good point to make to people that you meet who are sitting home. I, I talked to someone today who says to me, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm coming. I'm going to come. I know I need to be there. I'm going to come. And I gave her my illustration. I think I gave you last week about as I was driving, we were driving to Colorado and observing all the many communities of, of the animals. And since I've been home, our, our birds, the trees are full of birds. Birds don't wander off and just single out by themselves, do they? You know, have y'all had that old saying, birds of a feather fly together? <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, antelope herds flock together. And even fish stay in their little, what do you call them? School. School, School thank you. Uh, y'all are so smart. See, y'all know this. You know why? Because their creator, this is important, important part for you to make some people. Their creator knows that if they can be divided up in individuals and never have contact with each other, they will cease to exist. A <laughs> booger will get them, that's right. And they will cease to exist. They have to stay in a community to be procreated, right? And so it is with the body of Christ. It was not intended that the body of Christ be splintered out. And one person sitting home reading their Bible and praying is not as powerful as 25 people gathered together. They're not as powerful. There's power in numbers in the kingdom of God and in this world. And so it's so crucially important. So these people, Paul, Barnabas, Jesus, always went to the synagogue. You will never find a church that is perfect. And as some people have said before, if I went to it, it wouldn't be perfect anymore. There is no such thing as a perfect church. Oh, they look perfect on the outside, and sometimes people who present it, oh, you need to come to our church because we're blah, 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 they tell. But when you start going, you're going to find out some flawed people go there too. They're people. As long as people go to church, there will be flawed churches. But according to the scripture and what I see about the Bible, it is so crucially important. So when you meet those people out there, I know Roger has spoken before about this. He knows a lot of people that are out there just thinking that they can be alone. That's a very selfish way of thinking in the first place because you're not helping anybody but yourself. And that's not biblically correct. You're supposed to be helping and strengthening and encouraging other believers in the body of Christ. So as soon as they got to a city, they immediately went to the synagogue. Now in this case, they went to the synagogue of the Jews and there they were to minister. And because this was a new revelation, see the revelation of Jesus Christ was just being spawned, just being, just being brought together for the first time. This was the new understanding of what actually had been uh, promised in the Old Testament. But it was necessary that Paul go out and he was breaking new ground. There was a new understanding because now Jesus has come and all those Old Testament scriptures of his suffering that the Jews didn't understand or really even reason with, uh, Paul now understands why all of that was necessary and he understood the purpose of it all. So now he's bringing the true message of the Messiah to the world and starting with the Jews to try to bring them with an understanding. See, pagans had no understanding of the Old Testament. He, they, when he went in to preach Jesus to them, it was from no foundation of any understanding of anything. But going into the Jewish community, and you'll see it as he begins to expound it here, and we probably won't go into that section uh, verbatim because he gives the history. He goes into the synagogue. He goes back and goes back to Abraham and even sometimes uh, 
to Adam and Eve and Abraham and all those people, and he brings the people up according to the scripture, up to the understanding of who Jesus is. Because let me tell you what Brother Muzzerall says, if you get Jesus wrong, you got everything wrong. And so that's, you know, that, that's where we are. And so they would bring him. And, and, you know, as children of God, we've got to uh, exalt Jesus Christ. He said, if I be lifted up, you know, I, I don't want to draw people unto me. They don't need me. They need Jesus. Amen. And God help us to get aside from ourselves. You should never get offended when people reject you because it's not about you. You should never get offended. You try to help somebody know Jesus and they end up hurting your feelings. It's not about you. Jesus said it to his disciples. He said, they haven't rejected you. They rejected me. And there are many people you're going to touch and they're going to hurt you. But they're not rejecting you. That's, my husband said this before when he felt changed. He said, um, you know, don't, don't get mad at me, get mad at God, you know, because he'd, he'd quote a scripture, well, don't get mad at me, get mad at God. And the Holy Spirit corrected him, you know, uh, no, don't get mad at God. Get mad at me if you have to get mad. But don't get mad at God, whatever you do, because if we don't lift Jesus up and if they don't see Jesus, there is no hope. There is no hope without him. So they preached in the synagogue, and when they had gone through the isle into Pam Pampas, they, they found a certain sorcerer, a, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. Now this guy was a fake. He was a fake. He was acting like he was a godly man. He was acting like he was a Christian. But it says, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man. So he, he was with the leader, this guy of the country, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that's what his name is interpreted, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. He stood between Paul and Barnabas and this deputy trying to keep them from bringing revelation to him. He didn't want Paul and Barnabas there. He knew it would mess up his play party. People will reject the message of the cross because they don't want you to set their friends free. I want, you know, there are people that want to keep control of somebody. And the message of the cross sets those people free and they don't want you to do it. They don't want them to be free. There was a young minister in Baton Rouge that, that went to a pastor, this story was told to me, I think Brother Larson, went to a pastor of a church and tried to convince this pastor in Baton Rouge about the message of the cross and the grace of Jesus and how you can be free and, you know, all the freedom that is in Christ and the wonderful, it's so exciting, it just makes you want to tell everybody in the world. And the pastor, when he finished, said, I believe everything you said is the absolute truth. But if I preach that to my people, they will go stone crazy and I will not be able to control them. There are people that just want to control other people in case y'all don't know that. But ding, ding, ding in your head up there. There are people in this world who thrive and, and totally exist for the purpose of controlling other people. This guy right here was one of them. <laughs> no. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right, Roger. That pastor. You're right. That pastor is totally, they're just having to lie to him a lot. <laughs> when you try to control people like that, they just end up having to lie to you all the time to keep you feeling good about what they're doing. Absolutely, you're right. And so he was still seeking to turn, the, he wanted to turn the deputy away from the faith. He was scared of the faith. Then Saul, who also was called Paul, and, and thank God they changed his name to Paul because I can say it now. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and he set his eyes on him. <laughs> and he said, oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, you child of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. And you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. Immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. 
he, everybody left him. He didn't have anybody. Then the deputy, the guy he was trying to protect, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. In other words, he was converted. That deputy was converted to the gospel. And it says, now when Paul and his company uh, loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, there's a story about John Mark leaving them, as you know, and, and they'll get into that later. But the point that I want to make to you and to leave you with tonight that you understand is that we are living in a world of deception. The Bible says that in the last days, the number one problem in the world is going to be deception. I mean, if you read, they asked Jesus questions and his answer for the last days was always be not deceived. And the Bible talks about even the very elect could be deceived if we're not, you know, and I, I, that's another scripture and I won't go into all the details of that. But you need to understand that none of us are above deception if we're not careful. We need to be careful whose voices we listen to. We need to seek the face of God and get truth from God and not be tied into things that people want us to believe or think or see, but let God be the one let God be the one who teaches us and shows us the truth, even to our own cost, even if it costs me something. I've got to stand for the truth. I've got to stand for the truth. And I've got to stand committed to the furtherance of the kingdom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That should be the reason we get up every morning. Help me, Lord, to grow more so that I can be a greater blessing to someone else. Help me, Lord, not to be so self-centered that I am so soaked into my little offenses and my little junk that I can't even see where you want me to go. I don't want to be blind like this guy because I'm stubborn and trying to go against what God wants. I want to be open, my eyes wide open, always open, because somebody needs Jesus everywhere you go because he's the only one worth giving to anybody. Amen? Amen? Good, good God we serve. God bless you. I love you. Thank you for your attention tonight.